everybody and this is a full screen presentation of identifying minerals this is the online physical geology course at San Jacinto College Central Campus so in order for a substance to be defined or be classified as a mineral it has to obey four criteria number one it has to be naturally occurring that means that the substance is found naturally here on earth and it forms in a natural way Number two, minerals are inorganic solids. That means that they are not alive and they were never tied to life. Number three, minerals have a definite chemical composition or a definite chemical formula. So for example, NaCl or HCl or something like that. Those are mineral formulas. And number four is that minerals have an ordered internal crystal structure. That means that all the atoms are arranged perfectly into some form of lattice. So if the um, substance is a solid anyway, then it will have an ordered internal crystal structure. So let me show you four things and I'll put you to the test. So this is a picture of concrete. Is concrete a mineral? Does it obey all four of those criteria? And the answer is no, because concrete is a man-made substrate, or it's a substance. So it is not naturally occurring. Number two, this is a picture that I took when I went to Germany. Uh, this is a wall of salt. So is salt a mineral? And the answer is yes, it's naturally occurring. Salt is not alive. It's sodium chloride, which is a formula, and it's a solid, so it has an internal crystal structure. Number three, this uh, is a picture of sugar. So are sugar crystals a mineral, or is sugar a mineral? And the answer is no, because sugar comes from sugar cane, which is an organic thing. So it's a plant. And the final one, which is a tricky one, is ice. Is ice a mineral? <coughs> and the answer is yes, you can find ice naturally on Earth. Now some would argue, well, you can't find ice at room temperature but it is naturally occurring, so technically ice is a mineral. So the remainder of this presentation will focus on the physical properties of minerals. So the first one obviously is color. This is how you identify minerals. And this is the most unreliable physical property to use by itself because you don't want to just tr identify minerals by using color alone. Um, however, it's usually the first one that you see when you're trying to identify minerals. And minerals can come in different colors due to impurities that are trapped inside of their crystal lattice. So minerals of the same species, like quartz for example. So these are pictures from my own personal mineral collection. This is all fluorite. You can see that it has a similar type of shape. It looks kind of boxy or kind of cubic. So we have an orange fluorite, we have a kind of a, a weird green fluorite in the middle, and then we have what's called coke bottle green fluorite in, on the right. So fluorite can occur in any color in the rainbow. You get blues and purples and uh, even uh, clear or colorless. So you can't use color alone to help you identify fluorite and other things. You have to use uh, other physical properties, which I will define for you now. So number two is hardness. Hardness is a mineral's resistance to abrasion or resist scratching. And of the four or five thousand minerals that have been described in the earth, they are all measured against a scale of ten minerals, which are called the Mohs scale or the Mohs hardness scale. So this scale goes from one to ten, with one being the softest mineral and ten being the hardest. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the Mohs hardness scale. So talc is the softest mineral in the world, followed by gypsum, which has a hardness of 2. And right at 2.5 or 2.5 is the hardness of your fingernail. So if you had a mineral in your hand and a fingernail will scratch it, that means it's classified as soft. So these two minerals right here are called soft. Calcite, fluoride, and apatite have a hardness of 3, 4, and 5. And that is a uh, medium range because glass has a hardness of 5.5. So all of these minerals, none of these minerals will scratch glass, 1 through 5. Uh, but since 1 and 2, you can scratch them with your fingernail, then calcite, fluoride, and apatite are called medium. 
six, seven, eight, nine, and of course diamond at number 10 is the hardest mineral in the world. These all scratch glass. So this is a picture of talc. It's the softest mineral in the world. So my fingernail will easily scratch it. In fact, you see that I was laying it on this little piece of paper and there's little chunks that are just kind of coming off of it. Uh, this is a picture when I went to Amsterdam. Uh, these are real diamonds. So uh, worth about, I think, 20 or $30,000 or something like that. So uh, these, uh, this is the hardest mineral known. is uh, at, a, at a hardness, a Mohs hardness of 10. So the third mineral property is luster, defined as how the mineral shines in reflected light. So you have basically two broad choices for luster. You have metallic and non-metallic. So it's usually the first physical property test that you would conduct in the lab or even in the field to help you separate the minerals into two broad groups, either metallic or non-metallic. And there are different sub-luster choices. There are vitreous, which uh, means it shines like glass. Vitreous is a non-metallic word. Splendid means it's ultra shiny metallic. And then we also have words like dull and earthy and waxy. So this, these are two minerals in one. This uh, silvery kind of gold stuff is pyrite, which is iron sulfide. And then the little dots of things is sphalerite, which is zinc sulfide. So both of these minerals have a metallic luster. They look like metal. Uh, this is just ordinary quartz. This is non-metallic. So even though this has a vitreous luster, it shines like glass. It does not resemble metal in any form. Now number four is a tricky one, and number four is breakage. <clears throat> breakage is how the mineral beha behaves uh, if, if it gets broken. So if you drop it on the ground or if you hit it with a hammer. And the two choices for breakage are either cleavage or fracture. So minerals will either cleave or they will fracture. Cleavage occurs when the mineral breaks along planes of weakness, as I will try to show you. And the choices for cleavage are 1D or one direction, 2D or obviously two directions of cleavage, 3D cubic, 3D rhombohedral, and 4D octahedral. Now your lab book also describes a 6D, but that one's hard to see. Uh, if a mineral does not have cleavage, it obviously fractures. That means that the mineral breaks unevenly. And the two choices for a fracture are irregular or just normal fracture. And there's a special type of fracture which I will show you, which is known as conchoidal fracture. So this is muscovite mica at the top picture. This is a one direction of cleavage. So it can tear off into those thin elastic sheets, uh, what's known as basal cleavage. Now down here at the bottom, this is a chunk of gypsum with a razor blade stuck in it. So if the razor blade continued to do its job, it would basically break along a very flat place in one direction only. This is feldspar. So all feldspars exhibit 2D cleavage. So there's cleavage here. It's breaking along a very flat place here and probably breaking along a flat place on this side but there's no cleavage over here on this side. It's, it's kind of fractured. So there's one direction and two directions of cleavage. <clears throat> this is 3D cubic. These are cubic crystals. This is salt crystals. But if you whack them with a hammer, they're going to break into a cubic form. So there's one direction of cleavage here at the top. There's another direction over here. And there's a third direction here. So 3D cubic is different than 3D rhombohedral, which is what you see here. So this is not a cube shape. It's more of like a parallelogram. So you have cleavage here, one, two, three directions of cleavage. One, two, three directions of cleavage. And then fluorite occurs or behaves in an octahedral sense. So it can break octahedral with four directions of cleavage. One, two and then the back side and then the back side one two three four directions of cleavage so if you look at this one one two three four so basically looking at the top of that pyramid so this is a mineral that's not broken along a flat place it's broken unevenly and you see these lines or these curves this is conchoidal fracture so this is indicative of quartz 
or any kind of glassy material like obsidian, which is what's shown here, which is volcanic glass. And this is a mineral that is simply has irregular fracture. It's not breaking into flat places. So the next physical property, number five, is crystal shape. So this is the shape that crystals take in their natural form when they're growing in the natural world. So a crystal is different from breakage because a crystal grows or, or forms free of its environment, usually in a pocket or like a, what's known as a vug in geology, V-U-G, and, and I'll show you a picture of that next. So examples for choices for crystal shape include cubic crystals, hexagonal crystals if they have six sides, and then octahedral crystals, which I don't think I have a picture of. So this is a picture of a vug, or you might call this a geode, and these are calcite crystals that uh, I took a picture of inside of a cave, and these crystals have formed inside of this pocket, inside of this void. So if I came in with a hammer and a chisel and I started hitting this, then the bottom of this would fracture if I teared or I, I took out some crystals. So crystal is different from how it would break. Now this is a cubic crystal and it's a cube shape. So this was not broken in this form. It actually grew this way. Okay, these are hexagonal crystals. So if you examine these crystals very carefully, you would count six sides. So these crystals actually have a hexagonal shape. I just threw this in here just for, uh, for an added uh, emphasis, I guess. Uh, this was what's known as botryoidal form. So these are like bumpy crystals. So you can see that word botryoidal right there. <coughs> Okay, so we're almost done with this presentation. Number six is striations and exsolution lamellae. So striations are perfectly parallel lines or grooves that form either on the crystal face of a mineral or within the cleavage plane, as I will show you. So tourmaline and plagioclase feldspars often exhibit striations or have striations. Exolution lamellae is a phenomenon when one feldspar crystal uh, or mineral has grown inside of another. So it'll leave these kind of light colored streaks. So potassium feldspars have exolution lamellae. So you see these perfectly parallel grooves, which is on this watermelon tourmaline. So these are striations. So these striations formed on these crystal faces. And if you notice this uh, green feldspar, this amazonite feldspar, and that smoky quartz, if you look very carefully, you can see kind of streaks of yellow, and this is the exolution lamellae. You can see it best on this particular one over here. Okay, so streak is next, number seven. So the color of the mineral's powder when it's scratched upon a white porcelain bathroom tile. And streak is really helpful in the field, at least, in distinguishing between different forms of the same mineral. So minerals that have a hardness of seven or higher will not leave a streak. They're so hard, they'll just kind of scratch up the streak plate. So this is a metallic mineral, and this is also a, a metallic mineral. This one is kind of silvery in color, but it leaves, interestingly, a kind of a brownish streak. And this color here does match the streak color here. So not always the streak color is going to match the color of the mineral. Okay, uh, we're concluding our presentation here with number eight and nine. So optical properties is number eight, how light travels through the mineral. Transparent, translucent, and opaque are the main three terms under optical properties. There are two special optical properties to consider. One is a double refraction, which is a phenomenon that occurs in Iceland spar calcite, which I will show you. And then uh, ulexite is known as a TV rock because it has a fiber optic quality, which I will show you. So uh, window glass is transparent because light can obviously come through it and you can see through it. But something like frosted glass, you cannot see through it even though light is still coming through it. So that's translucent. And then this Coco Chanel, which was the best that I can do, uh, is a glass that's black, so it's opaque. So light cannot travel through there and uh, you cannot see through that. 
this is a double refraction. You can see two images as you look through this isolin spark calcite crystal, uh, which has been cleaved, by the way. This is a beautiful 3D rhombohedral cleavage. And then you like sight, which is a TV rock. Uh, it looks like you're watching TV at the top of the, of the mineral specimen here. <coughs> So other properties, uh, I just want to mention kind of in quick passing, um, paint dots have been applied to the mineral specimens at, uh, on our campus to show minerals that will fizz immediately or have a strong chemical reaction when a drop of hydrochloric acid is placed on it. So calcite is the one that we usually have a pink dot. If it has a yellow dot, it's going to fizz slow or it'll fizz better if you make a powder first. So I didn't write it up here, but dolomite is the one that has a yellow dot. So this is uh, effervescence uh, or uh, fizzing. So this is a rock that has calcite in it, so it's a readily uh, fizzing. So this would have a pink dot. So that is the end of the presentation. So thank you very much.